Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to another Football Canton episode. And this one is special because it's me again, Armin, calling the shots. And the reason for this is because Aram is a little bit too drawn to the World Cup and he's getting his thoughts together. He can't really do two things at the same time, apparently. Aram, what's up with that? Are you okay? I can't multitask, apparently. Not he's here, he's here with us, yeah. <laughs> Not everything. I, I get it, I get it. Not gonna do it. And Sharon, how are you doing? I'm watching Armenia in the World Cup. Oh, wait. No. Soon, soon, soon. Close enough. Close enough. Soon. I mean, we were doing great in the World Cup qualifiers, but things happened, as always, with Armenian football. Things happen, and better not to talk about them too much. Uh, Adam, okay, after the whole uh, bashing situation, I still love you, and I want to know how you're doing, bro. I'm good. I'm good. I'm uh, I'm I'm annoyed at the I'm annoyed at the friendly results. Still, I think that's the one thing yeah. that's looming because of just like another. Another great example of the Federation mismanaging things. Um, things, happen. things happen, but there were some bright spots, and and I think I think we'll yep. cover that. But there there are still like some big outstanding questions and some other things we consistently noticed throughout the two games that are a little worrisome. Mhm. Yeah. 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 A lot. <laughs> a little or a lot. I wouldn't know. One thing I do know is that most of the national team. Um, players this time out were from the APL. It was a mostly like heavily APL, Armenian Premier League, of course, for those not entirely familiar with it. Um, it was very much APL uh, squad. Like most of the players were from the APL. So we're going to get a little bit into that, in the, into the Armenian Premier League first and foremost, always started home and from inside out. Uratu is looking unstoppable. Like, seriously. Uh, Chatting, you yeah. know very well by now. They're, they're looking crazy. Like, okay, five yeah. points. They're like five points ahead of, from second place, which is Ararat Armenia, which is not a lot, right? Two, two victories, uh, difference in points. But on another uh, thing, important thing is that Alashkir has started the trail and has started to drop points as we, I don't know if anticipated because they were looking pretty good, but as we would have hoped, uh, Alaska is the uh, nemesis of Armenian football fans uh, locally, and they're starting to trail. And so let's first and foremost look at how things are looking. Urartu is leading the table with 41 points, as mentioned. Five points behind is second place Ararat Armenia, a huge team that is doing pretty, pretty well, but not as good as Urartu. That is the surprise there. Uh, still European spots and very much so the title race still on for Ararat Armenia, despite their five points behind the leaders. Third place for Alashkert, uh, 34 points. That is a little further behind and a game in hand for the boys in yellow. Fourth place, and this is already technically outside the European zone uh, in the APL, for Punic. That is starting to catch up after their whole European campaign. Great European campaign, all things considered. We're going to be doing a more of a wrap-up on Punique and all things Armenian football-related uh, next month or within the next month. But they're starting to catch up when it comes to playing their games. Uh, fifth place for Van, a good side, 24 points. And then, like, nothing too interesting in the middle. We got Lernay Narzakh, Ararat, Tirevan, and Shirak, Gyumri with 21, 18, and 15 points each. 
And down below, we have two sides, two teams that we like very, very much. Unfortunately, not getting the results we would we would have liked, uh, which are Bukama and uh, Noah with nine and six points each. Noah getting relegated surprisingly uh, at the moment. And yeah, both teams are good. They have good personnel, good young Armenian players with a lot of talent and potential, but they seem to be lacking something. Uh, first and foremost, Challenge, what do you have to say about the overall APL situation and scenario as things stand? As things that stand, uh, things are clarifying. Obviously, it's a bit early, but going into Christmas, uh, last month of the year, basically, well, it's clear, uh, it's clear how Uradu distinguish themselves from a large number of uh, teams from the APL. Uh, Ar- Armenia is looking to catch up. It's going to be between them two. Uh, Alashkert can catch up, but you know some of the results that they 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 brought in uh, the the last three games is a bit worrying for them. Uh, plus the considering that they're the worst defense in the top four is also an issue. So Punic can try to, they cannot really win the league. It's too difficult. However, they can give a shot for third or second spot. Definitely. Bro, you mentioned something very interesting there uh, when it comes to Alashkert being the worst defense in the four, in the top four. And actually, it's one of the worst in the whole league. Like, um, okay, not maybe not one of the worst, but until the seventh spot, they like you got Lenai Nartak in fifth and Ararat Yerevan in seventh, both having very much better defenses and way less goals conceded, all things considered. Uh, than Alashkert. Alashkert had 20 goals conceded, Lernayn Artsakh 15, and Ararat Yerevan 17. That for a small league like the APL, a relatively small league like the APL, that is a huge gap. Uh, Aram, what are your thoughts overall? Like, uh, you see this APL uh, table, right? What mm-hmm. is the first thing that comes to mind as, like, Okay, this is all I see. Um, I, I, it, it's, it's shades of last season, except instead of Punic, it's Urardu and Arara Armenia. Um, we had, I think, a similar thing where Arara was super dominant through 80, 85% of the campaign, and then suddenly Punic just oh. you know, shot up and overtook them and took that, that, that first place, the coveted Champions League spot, and the rest is history. Um, can Urardu maintain this form is the big question. Um, the, I've, one thing I've noticed with them is they're playing the same players consistently, while Arara Armenia rotates their players a lot better. So I think uh, fitness and freshness in the second half of the season is going to be crucial. Um, in terms of the point with Alashkert, they're... I, I, I can't... I've seen, from what I'm seeing, I think teams are starting to figure out their style of play, and that's going to come to their detriment. And it's only going to take a team like Shirak or, or Ararai Yerevan to take a couple points off of them in the later half of the season for them to start slipping even further down the table. Um, and I could see Punic moving up and challenging uh, for that third place spot and maybe even second place uh, now that they're not in European competition anymore. Yeah. Um, I, fully focused on on the league because they're out of the cup as well. Oh, sorry, they're still in the cup. Uh, so, league and cup, just the domestic action left for them. And um, they, we know they have arguably one of the best squads in the league. Um, so I think they can do it. Um, but I, I, it's going to be those four teams that we're going to be talking about near the end of the season. The gap in between Vaughn and yeah. Levin and Artsakh, it, it's a little too big now. Uh, and I think they're safe from relegation in the middle, uh, in the middle, along with Adarat. 
Um, and then the bottom is where it's getting a little interesting uh, with Beckman and Noah not doing so hot. But and I, I think I think it's going to be very tight, um, and it's going to come down to the last couple of match days, like how it was last season. I don't know who's going to win, but Uradu looked as good as Adada Armenia did last season, and we all know how that ended. True, true. I mean, you mentioned several good points there, as expected, but um, I think, yeah, that may happen because th- there's also one thing you guys haven't mentioned so far regarding Urartu, of course, the league leaders so far, which is the youth. Are Urartu uh, players ready, like mentally? and physically ready to undertake the whole season on that same level they've been showing so far. Uh, That's also going to be, in my opinion, a huge factor coming into play as things progress and as we start getting into the second half of of the season. Um, What else? Now, getting into the relegation, you want um, more a little bit hinting that things are getting interesting. Shidak does seem to be joining the pack in the middle of the table and getting further away from the re- the fight to avoid relegation, which so far, I, I mean, six points separate ninth place, which is second to last from Shidak. And that's a lot, as I mentioned, for a small league. So, and not not even to mention Noah three points even further. So I think the fight for relegation is sadly and unfortunately gonna be between Bukama and Noah, two young squads with a lot of talent, but both seem to be being misused uh, somehow. I don't know. I don't know why. I don't know why both teams are not finding their jam. Uh, They have plenty to go with. Any last thoughts or remarks regarding the APL, guys, before we move on to the next domestic competition? Uh, Just one last thing. One last thing from my end. Uh, Don't forget Mm -hmm. that the APL is going to be not happening for a couple months because of the winter pause. So there's going to be a long two-month break or so, and I think late February, early March, the APL is going to resume, but we still have a couple more match days before that happens. Mm, so we're going to be paying attention to what happens within uh, the next few weeks, going into the season break, the mid-season break, and yeah, and, and overall see how mid-season friendly windows uh, get them each team ready for the second half of the season. Uh, things are getting interesting, so be on the lookout for that. And in relation to the APL, the second Armenian domestic competition, the Armenian VBET Cup, or VBET Armenian Cup. We have gone through the quarterfinals and semifinal uh, teams are all ready. First and foremost, we got Shirak beating Ban 2-0, Shirak Gyumri, a giant from Armenian football that has lately been falling due to financial issues. They're getting back on track and doing pretty decent when it comes to the cup. Uh, 2-0 against a solid side like Ban is not, there's no joke. I mean, Ban are also rotating a lot of players, but still it doesn't, justify them losing 2-0 against a newly promoted and still relatively weak squad as a Shirak. So uh, good for Shirak. Well learned. Uh, their spot in semifinals. Second, we got Gantasar from Kapan beating Alashkert <laughs> Giant on penalties. Another newly promoted side. After, again, another big team from uh, outside of Yerevan, much like Shirak that is back and uh, in Armenian professional football after a shaky couple of seasons or not. Uh, 
of course, the reasons are different. Chirac was due to finances and stuff, and and Kantasar was due to the invasion of Armenia proper, actually, unfortunately, of course. Uh, good to see them beat, actually, Alasket, a giant, after drawing nil-nil uh, in regular time, going to penalties and, and winning 5-4. Uh, thus, Kantasar Kapan became the only second division team left in the Armenian in the VBED Armenian Cup, left alive. And I think there's also another thing that's more important than that, than the second division team fact is that they brought happiness to a lot of people to a city and a province that are the uh the ones suffering the most the the ones on the technically front lines the ones with which their their whole survival is the first to be threatened so it's good to see them get another reason to smile and honestly I hope Kantasa keeps going through. Uh, I, why not winning the the cup? Uh, that would be very debatable, though, because then you get into them playing Europe, and I don't think they're ready for that yet. But I I do hope they get to the final at least. Uh, third. We're predicting this. Remember, uh, when we're we found out uh, about the draw and everything during the summer we're predicting when we're saying how we need the second division teams to, to to try and go as furthest as possible because of the draw the the draw was like not too much in favor of them but i mean that's that's going to be the case most often so but hopefully they can go they can go far it's going to be tough going against urardu uh, i'm not sure how the draw works I don't know if they've already uh, concluded who is against who next round. No, oh, it's going to be drawn soon. I think next week. So oh, okay. It's going to be tough against Urardu. Uh, against any of them, uh, especially Urardu. Yeah. Uh, best, so we got, best case scenario for them is Shirak, honestly. Shirak, definitely Shirak. Yeah. And that would make an interesting draw because you would have two... Uh, Yerevan sides, Yerevan sides uh, facing each other, and two outside of Yerevan in Shirak against Kantasar. But we, we're going to see next week or so uh, when the draws conclude. For, uh, third game, and what? <laughs> wow, what a result! Would have to not just tearing things up in the APO, they just tore. Literally, FCAA Ararat Armenia, a new one for new. I'm sorry for my friends, but for new against Ararat Armenia. With I just saw the lineups, it wasn't like a substitute, like a second string Ararat Armenia side. They weren't playing reserves or B side players. No, they were playing some of the best, and still, Urartu did not hesitate nor joke around 4-0 bro that is huge and what a way for Urartu to keep going further and forward I mean I I did the same thing the first thing I did when I saw the score is check the lineups and I was like what lineup yeah. was Adada Armenia playing and it was like oh no this was a good lineup <laughs> but, bro I'm telling you I mean uh, if you're a fan of any team or involved in any team in Armenia that is not Urartu in this moment, you should be scared. Like, wow, this is no joke. They may not be, they may not have what it takes to win the APL, which we will see because it's still looking good for them. But coming from a final last time out in the Armenian BBED Cup, and now heading into semifinals like this, and Actually, if I think about it, if you think about it, they did deserve to win the final last time out. They didn't win it because of lack in, in, in efficiency in the last part of the pitch inside the box. But the game they displayed, it was dominant and they deserved to win it. They just, just didn't. And now they're getting goals and a ton of it. Uh, Punic, Noah were the last game of the quarterfinals, a huge 
win, 3-0, no risk, no danger for Phoenix whatsoever. I feel really, really bad for Noah. They have really good players, really good young potential Armenian like national team players uh, with a lot of potential, so to speak, exactly. And they are doing awful. Like, I mean, a little bad luck to get unique, of course, but still a 3-0. Uh, what are you guys' thoughts on the cup? Um, it's it's I think overlooked most of the time by by the bigger clubs in the league. I think and and it's a shame because it, you get a European spot from winning the cup. And in in my opinion, it's a lot easier to get a European spot through the cup than it is in the league because since the um, inaugural conference yeah. league tournament. We don't have any more Europa League spots. So second and third place in the league at Conference League, but so does the winner of the Cup, which used to go to fourth place. Um, that's like a recent change that was made. And it's for a lot of the larger teams, it's only winning like two or three games in a row, three games in a row, and you automatically get your European spot. So if I'm if I'm Shidok and if who's you know lower on the table, or if I'm Gonzasar who's not even in the first division, I'm looking at this and thinking great opportunity for me here uh may they may not even get past the first round of conference league qualifiers but nevertheless it's a good experience and i think especially getting that experience outside of yerevan will be great so i wouldn't mind seeing a team like shirak win the cup and play european football again um and and bring european football back to gumri um so in in terms of who looks the best out here it's urardu and punic obviously but um it's it's a loser go home situation, and um, we know we know how Punic has been in those situations because they've been in a lot of them lately uh, due to the Conference League. Uh, but yeah. Urardu are just looking really really dominant, and if they can do the League Cup double, which hasn't been done I think since Adara Armenia a few years ago, it would be pretty good. Shall I? 100% agree with uh, Aram. This is going to be very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, let's see how each of them fare as time goes on. Well, yeah, a lot of theories I'm starting to think and, and conspire a little bit on what might, might happen, but don't want to get too, too ahead of myself. Season break coming up. A lot of transfer rumors starting. Uh, who comes, who goes. But always eyes are going to be centered around one guy. And one guy, especially when we talk about Armenian football uh, domestically and abroad. Now, like, the new prince, the, the G-O-A-T. The goat, uh, the young king, more than a prince, I would say. Rumors starting to spread again on Edward Spetskan's situation. Uh, again, like revamping the whole offers he got uh, in the last few transfer windows. Did he get them? Did he not? Interest was there from top five clubs, like I would say 10 up to 10 clubs from top five leagues that were interested in sports and, and still are, but they are now, is he going to be moving? The, I think the, the latest development uh, showed one, one div one change from what we knew previously, um, which was English, an English team now is apparently interested and there were no English yeah. teams previously yeah. reportedly interested. Uh, so that makes me think, you know, maybe partially because of this Arsene Zaharian to Chelsea thing, people yep. were starting to look a little bit more at the Russian league. And I think the first thing they'll see is Edward Spreadstown. They'll be like, how is this kid still in this league? It doesn't, you know, something's not computing here. Um, will he leave <laughs> in January? I doubt it. I don't think he will because um, I think he's going to want to see the season through with his club. I think he's just going to want to finish it off as strong as possible. It's his boyhood club try to get them at, mm-hmm. as high up the table as possible because he's he's been carrying that whole team uh, on his back. Um, and then hopefully a good departing gift will be 10 million euros in the bank. 
for Krasnodar. Yeah, more than that, I would say. Plus, the, as you said, the recent, the most recent developments were that he is not interested or reportedly would not be interested in a move this uh, tra- mid-season transfer window. But and one thing that I, I haven't heard come up is what about a, a club purchasing him in January and just loaning him back for the rest of the season, which happens, which very, happens very regularly. Yeah, actually, yeah, it, it, it did happen to a guy I'm going to be bringing up later on the, in the, this episode. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's something, it's like a uh, football market uh, phenomenon that's been increasingly happening more and more recently, especially since COVID. Uh, I don't know. That could be. Maybe we're, we're, maybe you just did something, Adam. Maybe somebody's listening to us. Maybe. That would be my preferred. And the only reason why I say that is because I, I would want him, I would yeah. want his exit to be guaranteed already. Um, so, and I think that's a win win. Krasnodar gets to keep him until the end of the season. He gets to finish his season with his club uh, and they get the money. And then he has that guaranteed contract and the guaranteed movement to a new club, uh, all before something, you know, unforeseen or stupid happens uh, later on in the season. I think. Better to get the deal done early and loan him out. He's definitely leaving. I mean, I I would say it's not m- so much about the what as to the when. It's a matter of when he's leaving, leaving in my opinion. Uh, the John, where? Got a, what do you got to say about the young king? And, and the, the where? EB transfer situation. Like I said twice. And the where? So yeah. we, we're, we're going to see where he's going to end up. There's apparently several clubs going after him. I don't know if it's true. All we know is why shouldn't they be looking at him? There are several reasons. And we looked at those reasons many, many times. If there's someone listening to us, they would know how much we oh. not just love this kid, but praise him. And for and many so. reasons. So. And rightfully so, yes. Um, I mean, in 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 terms of national team, what he's going to show is uh, is going to be in March and June. So that's uh, that's exactly before the transfer uh, the summer the summer transfer market opens up. Uh, during January would be it would be also ideal, maybe. Hopefully not. I, I, I'm not jinxing it or anything, but to, injuries. Um, he, he won't sustain. He won't get one. So he he can just make the move, and everything will be confirmed in terms of paper, in terms of medical, in terms of everything else. Let me knock on wood. Okay, knock on wood. Done. Uh, he won't get the I word you just mentioned. Uh, but you mentioned you brought up the where before moving on, right? Uh, Aram brought up Arsene Sakharian, and all of this make me makes me think about uh, inevitably our Georgian homie from Georgian footy. We uh, shout out you guys, Suica. The guy went from the RPL to um, Syria, and now he's staring up there. Uh, he's uh, setting the whole thing on fire uh, at Napoli. And actually, Spertian has much better numbers. Uh, not, not, not to bring Twitcha down, but rather to show just how good this young king is. They don't call him the heir to Mokhitaryan for no reason at all. Uh, he is making history for, both for Armenia and club and individual level. Uh, we know Spartan became the by far over a year difference, the youngest Armenian national team to make their uh, UEFA Champions League group stage debut one year and a month younger than Makitayan when he did with Shakhtar. Um, he scored on his debut and, and actually assisted for the Grand Partizan's winner uh, on the, from the penalty kick spot uh, 
against Romania 3-2. MVP with only 30 minutes that game on his very debut for the senior national team. Uh, he just became club vice captain at Krasnodar and acting captain as we tweeted uh, since uh, goalkeeper Beast Matvey Sapponov uh, for some reason didn't didn't play their last game. So Edo Spetsian carried Krasnodar with the captain's arm, armband against uh, Nice Technician's Lokomotiv actually with a win on them. So this kid's huge. Like, there's no way around it. Uh, so as to the where, hopefully Serie A, much like Twitter, or uh, in any case, uh, Bundesliga. Definitely not, definitely not, definitely not uh, English Premier League. I, I wouldn't like that. But we talk about Edward Spetsian, and we talk about the Armenian national team, inevitably. Because that's where things are. Like the main event of the evening. National team friendly camp has concluded. And as expected. Right, guys? Yeah, I yeah. don't think I don't think we were too optimistic going into <laughs> these games. Um, especially when, when the squad came out and we saw some of the personnel and we were like, um Same old, same old. And I think we can go even 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 before the squad. I think when when they announced that Berezovsky would be the interim coach for the two games, I I said it. I was oh. like, there's no there's no point in in when even watching these games because we're not going to see many new players. We're not going to see a new coach implementing a new mm. style. We're just going to see the same things because he's mm. just going to try to emulate what he saw before him, and he's just going to play the players he knows, and that's exactly what happened. Challenge? Yeah, similar stance. The friendlies are supposed to be for testing new things. That's the top of the on top of the checklist. I don't think that was done. Uh, now, you guys mentioned something, and the word "test" comes to mind, uh, as you mentioned. It is a test, as the friendly word, but this friendly camp was originally set up with one reason and one reason alone, to get the team ready for the March window, which consists of only one official game, March 2023, Armenia. It ain't looking ready. Yeah, exactly. That exactly what I'm getting into. March 2023, Armenia hosts Turkey. That is where things should have been, right? That was the whole reason why this camp was set up to get the team ready to call the squad you're gonna call against uh, in March against Turkey and get them together, give them practice, rotate put a little bit of the subs, but from that squad, you know, not from an APL uh, selection camp. Uh, I, th- I, th- yeah, I was, I was actually thinking about this post this friendly camp because I saw, I can't remember what country it was, but uh, announced a friendly that they were having before their opening European qualifiers game in March. And I thought, okay, that's, that's something Armenia should do. Let's book a friendly four or five days before that game and use that as the as that opportunity the, the missed opportunity of what this should have been for um but granted there were several players missing key players obviously like our best player wasn't there um arguably our best two players five of them. Weren't, weren't part of this camp um which was fine but um there were some bright spots though yeah, yeah, yeah. We're we're gonna get into that. We're definitely gonna get into that. But um, before doing that, I mean, you just wasted a huge opportunity, the the opportunity to get the team ready. Uh, if you are the, uh, of course, I'm I'm referring to the FFA. Yeah. That, that that just makes me think that they didn't get the coach they wanted, or they're still in negotiations with coaches that they would prefer to have and so they were like 
they didn't want to rush and make the selection, which I'm fine with um, for sure, because I don't want them to bring up, you know, a random manager. But some of the names we've seen thrown out there were were awful names. It's like I'm not we don't want a Russian coach. You know, why are you going to wait this long and appoint someone that's not great? Uh, but we'll get into like the the rumor mill later. Yeah, but even if it, I agree, most likely the FFA did not get the coach they wanted, or one of them, they, they wanted any of the coaches they wanted. But even then, the coaching stuff is going to stay the same. Like, they're just going to be hiring a coach and an assistant coach. But the whole coaching staff is going to remain the same. Javi Miniano is going to still be the basically head of the whole coaching staff without having the title of head coach. Uh, Pablo is still going to be the physiotherapist. Uh, Berezovsky is still most likely going to stay as the goalkeeping coach, uh, despite now being promoted uh, as an emergency, which did not go so well, uh, to head coach. The coaching staff is going to remain the same. So why shouldn't the squad remain the same? In the good ways, because the squad did remain the same in the bad ways, which is calling some old, with all due respect, and bad, with considerably less respect, players uh, that we keep on praying they get dropped. And for one reason or or another, they're not. Um, I don't know what to make of this anymore. Uh, but before analyzing these the games you mentioned, we were lacking two players. I think it was more. Let's see. You got Edward Fertian, Horen Bayramian, Ovane Sampatsumian, Andrei Chalashir, uh, and David Yushchenko. That's five started, like undisputed starters. Right off the bat, not cool. For one reason or another, Injuries, uh, travel, competitions at club level, whatever it may be. Those five, that's literally half the squad, guys, in the audience, everybody. Half the squad, we're going to be playing against Turkey with the starters. We're not there. What are you even making this friendly camp thing to begin with? If you're not going to be having your starters or your subs, like, considerably regular team you're going to be playing with doesn't make sense now on top of that and in addition you got three more that are part of the team uh even though they don't play every game or they don't get to every armenian national team camp they are part of the team and when they do they are starters as well you got sarkis adamian norberto briasco balekian and lucas telaraya all three of them also not called up. These ones make a little bit more sense because of the reason I just mentioned. But on top of that, yeah, go ahead. One thing that I noticed, I'm getting uh, I think a, yeah. a consistency in both games, and and I say this because of the names that you mentioned, um, with no Lucas and no Edward, there was a lo- there was a lack of a creative spark in the team. And it was pretty much left down to the front three, uh, which was consistent in the starting lineup in both games of Shahoyan, Bichakchan, and Babayan, um, who, who, to do to do all the work. Um, and and I remember thinking, I'm like, okay, you you bring in Spetsan, you bring in uh, Lucas, or you you just bring in some sort of creativity because the people who were in charge of it in these two games, uh, which was Harutunian and Dashian, um, weren't playing so well. Um, for a and multitude of, of reasons. Yeah, they were tired. The guys had played like five games in nine days. Um, and I remember thinking, make those couple changes and this front three will be even more lethal because they'll have even more opportunities. So um, it's it's not all doom and gloom, but again, it's it just comes down to the one thing that we've always been complaining about, which is personnel. It's why are some of these players still being played? And yeah. Yeah, I mean, you also brought up rotation which is one thing we were complaining about during the uh, Caps' second half uh, of his tenure. 
rota- he was getting worse and worse when it came to rotation, and it showed. And now Bereza, as you mentioned, he Berezovsky is doing the same mistakes as he was as, as Kaparros did, because as you mentioned, he's just doing what was there, like he's yeah. not. Yeah, I think there was only what one one change or something in between the two lineups. I think it was Hakopian played the first game and uh, Voskanian came instead of him in game two. Oh. That was the only change. And it's like you're playing a friendly where you have all these good under-21 players on the bench and, like, you only make one change? That's 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 just stupid. One bad call after another, which makes you think, bro. We, we did play awful for most of the friendlies. There were some spans of time where we, where we played good, but uh, we did deserve to concede more. And if you consider things like this, uh, this team with the changes we keep uh, asking for is definitely, in my opinion, a team that may be potentially, hypothetically, with many whys, able to fight for a major tournament spot. Like, it's almost there for the taking. It just takes a little more professional approach, a little more, a little less egos, uh, a little less, you know, yeah. that kind of thing that we know so so well as our media. One thing we should bring up, though, is is uh, a player that was part of the squad, Avetis Avetisian, um, from Go That's Ahead okay. Eagles. He was a special case. People were complaining that he wasn't playing, but that was something you found out was because of a, um, a paperwork a issue. Thing. Yeah. So, again, I think it was still beneficial to have him there. It's more of like cohesiveness, yeah. chemistry. Um, I, I would have loved to see him play, obviously, but I, I do think... For me, good sign. I don't think a player would accept a call-up to a country like Armenia if they didn't intend to make that full commitment. So that's one thing I'm very happy about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This definitely showed he is going to be playing for us. Uh, again, as with Edward Spetsian's transfer, it's not about the what now. It's about the when, and I'm super happy for it. Um, and now that you mentioned a Greek-speaking player... Let's, uh, before continuing with this many, many things we have to complain about, talk about regarding the national team, uh, let's ask our Greek-speaking resident uh, what he thinks about our uh, topics discussed so far. Charin, anything that came to mind you want to bring up or complain? You guys covered it up. No, I don't want to complain. (laughs) Because the complaining won't help. <laughs> uh, the most surprising detail for me was the fact that at some point or just generally the whole match, we were playing three at the back. I didn't I didn't get the chance to watch the match. Uh, However, yeah. when I saw the, the, the structure of the lineup, it was, it was a bit weird. Was it three at the back or five at the back? And however they switched up tactically, I'm not sure of. However, again, three center backs in the middle was very strange. It was maybe the most unexpected thing I would I thought I'd see. It, it went as it went exactly how you think it would. I think if I'm if I'm correct, there in the second half it was changed to a back four because all it was taking was mm-hmm. one ball over the top, uh, and yeah. the defense was just completely falling <laughs> apart. And you had Voskanian and and Haroyan next to each other, and and. Hadrian, I think, is a player that we can highlight who, in both of these games, uh, awful. played awful. Um, which he's, he's one player we never complain about, but he played terrible. Um, and and if, is it a confidence issue? Uh, is it a, you know, we, we don't know what it yeah. is. But, again, he's, his, like, leadership and personality and attitude is something that's going to be very important when we're playing Turkey. So I, I would hope he would be a lot more confident in March than he was in, in these matches. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the personality and the, the leadership uh, were there, but the confidence wasn't, and it was visible, and it was honestly uh, painful to see. I, I 
love him. He is the captain we need. And and personally, I look up to him very much, which is why it was so painful to see. I I hope he, thir- he turns things around uh, at club level because clearly that's uh, that like sets the tone for him uh, for the national team. Just shifting away from the negatives, though, let's let's just talk about some positives. Uh, there um, are. I really liked the front three: Shalvayan, Babayan, Bijak. Oh yeah. I, I don't think we can. I, I'm surprised it took us this long into the episode to mention how good Jidar Shalvayan was in both That's games. Uh, his goal against Kosovo was like a superb solo effort. Uh, he, him along with Bichakchan, were the creative sparks in both games. Um, Vahan had some really good long range shots. He's still, to me, a little bit. You know, not where he should be, and I think that's coming down to his lack of playing time at the club level. Uh, and then I think Babayan at number at the nine, I think he played really well. He had good hold up play. His yeah. distribution was really good. Um, I just think he, he he was finding himself being more of a creator than a finisher. Um, which is he should be at the national team. He he which he should be, but also he he's he's one of the players that has a very good shot on him on this team as well, and it's a you know. He he wasn't he didn't have enough opportunities uh, to show exactly. that and and then on the back end of the pitch, uh, Stiopa Mukherjee was great uh, both yeah. games. I think he made one he had like a one of the goals is like a deflection or or something or he, he misstepped. But overall, I think he out of all the central defenders we saw, he was front oh, yeah. and center the best um, out of all I the mean, defenders we saw. A couple of things here. Stiopa is, in my opinion, and we actually discussed this and when we were bringing this up, uh, not that we were shocked or surprised, but again, we just can't help to notice how good this kid is at such a young age. Uh, his professionalism, his talent with the ball for a guy almost uh, two meters tall uh, and 19 years old also. Uh, he does uh, like he he is a playmaker from the back. With like he's so many things, he's so good. He he does remind me of a better Haroyan at when Haroyan was 19 years old. He is gonna be potentially, and I knock on wood again, the best center back the Armenian national team has ever produced. Because I I can see it. I I remember Haroyan when he was 19 years old, and uh, I I I see this happening. Stiop is so good, bro, uh, and he has the mentality, which is something not many Armenian players would do. Shifting to Babayan in the front, guys, uh, the guys at the front. Uh, of course, we mentioned time and again, uh, football game from future stars, uh, Shawayan and Pichachian, uh actually r- raising to the occasion and and now shining the way we we knew they were gonna uh a few things i think the chuck Tian's personality is gonna be essential and it's gonna uh lead the way for the whole team in attack at least in offense against turkey since the grand part is gonna be absent for at least for the home game. So I can see Pachachan being the replacement for Tico and having him play increasingly well at national team level, never mind the club uh, front, is a good thing for him and, for the, and, and therefore for the whole team, right? And regarding Babayan, again, did the same thing he did against Ukraine in those 60 minutes he played. Uh, away in Poland, we were like basically as soon as it was subbed off against Ukraine, we lost the game because the, the Armenian national team game that time out started with him. Like he was the first defender of 11 and he was the first in attack. Like the ball went to him, he held it up and waited for his teammates, either got a foul, threw a foul on him. And actually, we're going to be discussing that. 
and and waited for the with the hold up of the rest of the team. He does that so good, bro. Like again, it showed. Um, if we didn't lose by more goals, it's mainly, ironically, mainly because of Babayan's game and and the, his whole uh, input to the team. You know. Let's talk about his hold up. I think I don't know if it was against Kosovo or uh, Albania, but what was it? We mentioned it: three or four yellows uh, on the defense uh, in one same game. Uh, Babayan got fouled so many times and so well created by him that he drew like five or four bookings uh, and yellow cards for the the opposing defense. That's what. Armenia should play. Like our midfield game was not there. It was awful. Let's be real. It was awful. The uh, defense lacked lack confidence. And even though we conceded only two per game, but offense was there. Had midfield and creation been better, we would have scored even more because the, the front three were like they were on point. Uh, all right. Ooh, interesting thing you bring up here. Is Nadek Grigorian not national team caliber yet? What do you guys think? Personally, a bit. Personally, a bit early to judge um, him and a few other cases. I don't know. I think I'm I'm on the opposite boat, honestly. I think I I think we've seen enough of him in the national team shirt because he played a lot. He came off the bench a lot for Kaparos and as effective as he is when he plays at the club level and for under twenty ones, he I I don't see him being good enough to play for the senior national team. I just think there are other players um that might be better suited. Maybe other young players. Uh, that haven't yet been called up uh, yeah. as options off the bench, oh, but yeah, I, I think he's a good player. Is he is he the great player we thought he would be? I I don't think he's shaping up that way, unfortunately. Uh, but yeah, I, I I would I would prefer maybe bringing someone else instead. I mean, both with him and uh, the guy you're we're gonna be mentioning now. Uh, his teammate in Urago said game of good chance. Uh, I, I would have to agree with Challenge. It's too early to say. Uh, they're too young. Uh, even though they are proven at APL level, I also agree with Adam because APL level is not national, Armenian national team level quite. And it's too early to judge. There's two cases as well as similar ones. Uh, if you get the picture, because they're they're not bad for the national team level and standards, but they're not difference makers. They're not like if the team's not playing well as they uh, as it wasn't. Neither of them and and similar plays like this is gonna change anything. Uh, like it's all about the input. It's all about the in- the input to the team. If they're not gonna be bringing something different, something special, as many other players we're going to get into uh, in just one minute. I don't know. It's like they're meh. You know, I like them, but they're not quite there yet. Now, a, a few players uh, we're going to be mentioning again and again and again that would have a solid and, and remarkable input into the national team would be like say for defensive mid which for some reason the ffa is against i don't know what the ffa has against uh, a national team playing with a defensive midfielder but it's basic football understanding you need a defensive midfielder in the vast majority of tactics it's a quintessential part of football and is it the kirchana cdm yeah but Again, he's young. yeah, yeah, yeah. But again, he's young, he's small, 
He's uh, inexperienced. He didn't play bad, but again, he he wasn't a different a difference maker. You bring but up. But I would rather play him than Arta Grigorian at this point because Arta yeah. Grigorian is aging. Again, if if you have them both, you should be rotating because together in the same squad as part of the same squad, they might be able to be onto something. But if uh, I don't know. We there are like four or five players. Uh, you got Rudik Makachan from Anana that is relatively young, very much proven, class, a good player, uh, with potential. Uh, you can call him up in form, uh, really, really, really fit. Uh, he's ready for a national team, maybe not as a starter, you know, but definitely fighting for a starting spot. Um, who else? You got got Muradian from uh, Ararat Armenia, uh, barely turned 30 years old, uh, proven experience again. Uh, had it not been for a two-year hiatus, he would have, uh, from professional football for personal reasons, he would have been not in FCAA but abroad, maybe. Uh, you got who else? You got Vasilis Bolosian from Unicos in Greece. Uh, He's playing more and more, maybe five, ten minutes a game. But well, yeah, the, I mean, the, we have options. It's not like we don't have. Uh, the 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 choice is is dependent on making that decision of bringing these players. And uh, Vasilis Bogosian is an, is a different case as well because obviously you have to make him join the national team and such. I mean, like yeah. with the paperwork and such. So uh-huh. it's not like we're we're out of options. It's just the the decision on. Who to bring is the uh, the issue? Yes, partly and partly because for some reason they uh, the FFA doesn't like to have many defensive mids in the squad. I don't I don't know why. Don't ask. I mean, we I think having this too last time out, Alfaka Korean in the self game of Kutchan was the most we've had in like since our undefeated streak with Caparros nine game undefeated. Uh, since that streak ended. I think we had one defensive mid in the whole squad per national team camp ever since until now. Positive note, yeah, but still plenty to do and, and plenty to improve. Last but not least, a player that, speaking of letting like the train pass, Pavel Gorillo, like not now, but in the four game window, that got, that kid should have been there. If if not start him, play him five minutes. And now this one's partly on cap as well because of the whole uh, I want to rely on experience like excuse. That wasn't an excuse. That's no not justifiable. Not not understandable. Now we are risking losing Gorelo, even though he's still playing in Armenia, and on the long term, we are risking losing him because for some reason the FFA don't want to play defensive mid. But before I get angry again, there are more good stuff. Now, uh, anyone? No. Okay, okay. I, I'm, I'm going to take this one because there's a whole uh, reason for this. Arthur Galoyan made his debut for the Armenian national team. Maybe it wasn't as good as expected with even. And listen to this, guys. You're going to be timing in on this later on, but Roman Berezovsky, acting caretaker of the national team, in the press conference publicly kind of bashed Arthur Galoyan and his performance. And this is a quote He did not perform as expected. Um, a bit unnecessary, really. Re- really uh, a bit yeah, unnecessary. I, you're being generous. I would have said, I was said stupid. Like, why? What kind of coach are you? Uh, well, he's not. So you, he's not. <laughs> that, that is true. <laughs> that is actually true. Uh, but honestly, like, this is one of the things that got under my nerves the most about Roman Berezovsky. Like, okay, maybe uh, having Russian interest more than Armenian interest at heart is understandable because of his ethnicity and then his upbringing. I understand. Even though he was born in Armenia, he's Russian. I get it. 
Uh, he likes Armenia, but he loves Russia. I get it. Again, I get it. I understand. Now, playing without a TMF, I understand uh, that's FFA's wish for some reason. Stupid, again, but it's like a concept mistake. You know, what else? Awful rotation. You get that from Cap. It's uh, heritage, the coaching staff heritage. Stupid uh, again, as well, but... I, I think I th- this all just comes down to like, we the the things that we saw in these friendlies were the same things that we saw in uh the nations league and in, in the tail end of world cup qualifiers so it's like we didn't see anything new so there's nothing new to analyze we're just complaining about the same old things mm-hmm. we just happened to have some bright spots uh that came out due to like the injury of Tigan Barsegan because i bet you if he wasn't injured he would play both games um and the inclusion of Galoyan which was good but great he finally came but then it's like okay you only give him 15 minutes and this guy missed a flight and you know whatnot or canceled flight or something like that so it's stupid like i think that's that's the one word you can use to summarize this uh this friendly camp it was just stupid well what i mean i what i hate the most about all this is the whole statement like why would you say that like why would you can say that to him to his face within the locker room like follow the code like you're part of a a team and not just a regular piece of the puzzle you're the coach you're like there are two people inside a team that must lead the way must pave the way for the rest of the extended team uh players squad like uh reserves uh subs uh sparings coaching staff uh, physio uh, cooks everything and that is the head coach and the captain the captain was lacking confidence and the head coach publicly like downplayed or or publicly um i don't know the word to it but he criticized although softly but still criticized a newcomer that uh, never mind the fact that he uh, was a russian national team uh, consideration player that chose armenia on top of that and and that constantly states that uh, how proud he is of his heritage those are extra stuff. He's a kid. Berezovsky is a KGB spy. Confirmed. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> he's a kid. He's a, in, a newcomer. You don't say that about a kid. N- never mind one that has just made his debut. Well, let, then, let, then let's shift it from, like, uh, coaches trying to fake it till they make it to coaches we would actually want to see. Because we're still, what, tail end of November... We have our qualifiers in a few months, three months' time. Uh, there's going to be a huge break for national team and for Armenian club football, and we don't have a coach. The most recent rumor was Claudio Ranieri, who was the coach that took Leicester City um, and won the Premier League title, made a few names very, very famous. He was the most recent one, but it came as a hefty sum. I think it was something like his demand was $4 million a year, and he said he would do it. Um, positives and negatives to that, in my opinion. Positives being he's a guy who could take a team of not the best quality players but make them play as a team, which is something that I think um, Armenia needs to do. I've all, I've I've mentioned previously emulating uh, the hung the Hungarian model. Hungary is a very very good team, always in always in the Euros. Uh, their players all play for solid clubs. They're not the best players in the world. They don't have a notable name, but they play great as a team. Um, so I, I think having a coach like that would be great. I think another drawback is a foreign coach. Um, language barrier. At this point, I mean, how, how many languages did we have in the locker room at one time? Spanish, uh, Armenian, Russian. It mixes things up. It doesn't make things great, in my opinion. I think... It, it it takes away from the cohesiveness. Um, yeah. So that that's that's one name that has been thrown out that apparently is willing to re- to coach the national team. Um, 
So I don't know. Any any, of, any thoughts? Still a lot of money. I mean, uh, just draw comparisons as you drew them with the Hungary team. Uh, the the average World Cup coach now in Qatar. We're going to be discussing that uh, the World Cup a little bit. But the the average coach in the World Cup right now makes uh, 2.5 million a year. Ranieri is asking over 25% more than that, like 30% more than that. And we're not Qatar, we're not Saudi Arabia, we're not Argentina, Brazil, Netherlands, uh, the US, Canada. No, we're Armenia. Like, yes, Armenia is being in, is uh, growing financially like never before, but we're still not there. We're still not rich. Uh, we're like, you gotta be cautious and, and, and smart about your hires. And Cap was a great hire in that regard, as, as well as many other uh, reasons. We would need somebody, somebody like him, in the meaning of somebody that would be uh, okay with uh, winning 10, 20% less than what he would make at club level to coach, uh, like to, to take on a challenge. That's what Cap did. Caparros is a, an eminence. Like Caparros is like a huge name with capital N in Spain, and he chose to leave things to leave things behind for a little bit and give up money to take on a challenge for a team with a lot of potential, but not so famous and and uh, that like romantic. Like Armenia is a romantic place. Like. Uh, we have a lot of potential. We we're not as famous as we should be, as we deserve to be, and a lot to offer. But it's a it's a whole challenge, and and we need more of that. Ranieri is asking a little bit too much. That the FFA should be smart about their hires. That's my two cents, right? Challenge, what do you think about uh, Claudio? Claudio... Claudio would be a big name. Uh, Regarding his experience, if it fits into the model of Armenian football, uh, I'm not 100% certain because I need to do research on that to understand on a deeper level of what he can uh, he can offer. However, there are one or two names I'm beginning to think that I'm beginning to brainstorm that are uh, that are possible to become the next uh, potential managers for our national team. Uh, I I I I already mentioned it before this call. Uh, I'm assuming there's a chance that Robert Arzumanian take up the role. Uh, I have my uh, not personal reasons, but like I have my thoughts on why uh, why he can be a good fit for it. Yeah. Arzumanian. Hmm. Let's get into that for a minute. And like, there are arguments for and against him. Uh, for as you said, if he's fitted or if um, no, uh, or if it's uh, possible or if it's possible for him to. Just overall, just to add how like uh, for him to be an Armenian national team coach, mm. I would say oh. I don't know. Uh, he knows the FFA inside out. He has been working with them at Ratu. Took the team to a Armenian Cup final on his first and only season at charge in charge. Um, he brought uh, several young Armenian players uh, to the first team and made them shine uh, and took them abroad as well as the Armenian national team for it itself, like, right? Uh, good results. All that is good reasons, but 
the cons come precisely after what he did at Kuraku and what he is currently doing, which is not being able to save Noah. Uh, Noah has financial trouble. They are, I don't know why, <laughs> I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't know. But they are having financial trouble. And reportedly, that is what's affecting the whole team, which again, as we mentioned uh, at the beginning of this show, as well as uh, every time we get, Noah is full to the brim with Armenian talent, Armenian young, under 24, 25 years old talent. And financial trouble is no excuse for them playing like they are. Uh, they're just playing awful. Aside from Levon Batanyan, their young uh, Armenian under 19 striker, they don't have many bright spots. Uh, so that's the big con for Arzumanian coaching the team. Uh, Aram, any thoughts on Arzu? No, I don't. I just don't think he's at the point in his career where he's ready to coach the national team. I think Agreed. he needs a few more club seasons under his belt. Yeah, hopefully I'm not. I'm just saying he can. He can. He won't be having so so much of the financial issues in the Armenian national team, and the fact that he's having issues there for taking uh, up uh, for taking Noah back up to the uh, yeah higher up basically in the league is a good enough reason for him to not be the coach of a potentially second division team Mm -hmm. and also a point that Arzumana can solve and I've been told by let's say inside information that he works well with uh, young players which is a complaint that we make on football Gentron that he can solve. If you if you will go yeah. and ask for young players to join his squad, and he he f- he feels that he can work with those players, I presume that the FFA would listen to I, him. I wouldn't mind him coaching the under 21s first. Ah, uh, there you go. Wow. Yeah. Okay. That, that master move, master play. Uh, that's where it's at. Put him as, uh, as U21 first for two to four seasons. He's young. Yeah. He can, like, he can <laughs> take the time there. Uh, but, I, but I do understand Chanitz's argument, though. He, When Arzumanin was playing, Armenia was at its peak, right? And and he was playing under Varda Minasyan. And he, he has a similar style of coaching to Vardar Minasyan in terms of like t- t- tactics uh, and approach. And he's familiar with all the players that are on the team. He's played with some of the players that are that are on the team. He's not afraid to play youth. I I, I completely yeah. get why why what Chanitz is saying though. I, I get it. Yeah, but at the same time, finances as I said, they, they shouldn't be an excuse. Like he's not being able to save Noah and. Uh, Again, he's most likely going to get relegated with Noah. He is doing some good stuff, as I mentioned, with uh, Levon Vatania especially. Uh, but putting him as U21 national team coach first would be the move. Like, not the best one, not the worst one. The only logical uh, next step for him, in my opinion. Give him two to four years of him running a project there. Uh, see, like, arranging a whole thing, a whole system, put it into practice, see how it goes. And then take the same core of players of that U21, he's gonna, he should be take, undertaken to the national team. And then you add the diaspora players, the experienced ones, and that would be an interesting project. But, okay, uh, discussed long enough no manager yet not yet when we don't know is there gonna be a new manager at all well we don't know that either so uh keep up with our news world cup qatar 2022 is underway with a lot of controversy uh we're gonna <laughs> no need to get into that there's plenty of controversy with the 
in the FFA and Armenian football in general every day. So uh, we did our previews. We did our, um, what is it called? Punches. Uh, champion. Predictions, let's say. Eh, sounds good. Yeah. And <laughs> so far, so good for me. Brazil is tearing up. I love watching them play. They're, wow, they're, they're amazing. They're so much, so fun. They're so fun, bro. As a neutral, they are so fun to watch. Uh, Challenge, you were mentioning something very interesting and super, super true. Uh, we had two upcoming rivals this season playing for the 2023 season playing the World Cup. Ah, Club yes. We should and keep an eye on. Yep, yep. Exactly. So, if you're a fan and a listener, uh, 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 an FK buddy out there in the audience listening to us, uh, we are trying to keep up with Wales and Croatia, but help us uh, watch their games, see what you can notice, and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. their strategy. DM. Yeah, shoot us a DM. Keep in mind, uh, most likely Luka Modric for Croatia and Gareth Bale, as well as Aaron Ramsey for uh, Wales. Um, already playing bad at national team level, so they might be stepping down from the whole squad. But only Modric yeah. is confirmed, right? So far. So only uh, Modric is... Okay, only Modric. Yeah, well, I mean, Modric, he, he can still play well, so, I mean, even if he's... Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh. oh, yeah. He's, even if he's old, he's he's not Arta Grigorian old. He's a different kind of old. <laughs> Why would you do that? Oh, I mean, it's, it's just I'm not trying to I'm not trying to criticize anyone. I'm just saying <laughs> how w there's a difference in quality in terms of oh. our players and others. It's it's good to be it's good to be realistic in terms of these things. Definitely so, which I mean is usually lack. So being realistic, watch the games you out there and talk to us. Shoot us a DM. Our DMs are always open, especially to talk footy. See what you notice. Yeah, and yeah. Please we'll inform us because some of us might not be watching the games. So. Yeah, Adam, <laughs> you're super involved in the World Cup. Uh, anything interesting you might want to highlight about it? Uh, well, talking about the two teams that are going to be in our European qualifiers, Wales and Croatia, neither of them are looking that great. Mm. And I'm very suspect of the Welsh quality. And I think. Um, I'm going to be honest. We have a semi-decent coach, and I think we should be more than good enough to to take points off Wales, uh, for sure. I and hope so. And Croatia, we already know. We've played against yeah. their first team. Um, and we mm. know that when we're at our A game, we can compete mm. with them. I would Again, be happy with... Okay. Yeah, I would be happy with a draw against them, of course. I would be ecstatic with that. Um, but in terms of the tournament itself, how it's going, I... I had picked Argentina to win the whole thing uh, and Serbia to be the dark horse. And I'm currently watching. It's the 61st minute and, and, and Argentina can't break down Mexico. And it's it's and I just know it's, there's going to be a counter attack and Mexico is going to score and Argentina is going to crash out of the World Cup. But my bracket is pretty much busted. I mean, this is what happens when you're so close to the game. You overthink about you overthink things way too much. So. <laughs> um, I still I still do think Serbia will do really well. They had Brazil in the opening game. That was always going to be tough, but um, yeah. they were a little shell-shocked. But I think they'll bounce back. Uh, Argentina, from what I've seen for the past hour in this game, man, not looking good. Yeah, I mean, I would say, like, I, I'm I'm pretty confident and happy with, uh, with my pick. The challenge, what about you and your pick? Uh... Look, I've not been watching games. Uh, I've been busy working on my own coaching, uh, for those who don't know. Um, so, in terms of uh, my predictions, France is doing well. Uh, my dark horse was also Serbia, just like Aram. I, I don't know how they did against Brazil, but I've been told that they fought hard and they can still oh, yeah. go on to the next one. Uh, and my disappointment was Spain. Well, they scored seven, so I think that was a slap uh, to me. I mean, they can even make it through their group, and they might be still in line to be a disappointment. Any like for Spain, anything uh, less than quarterfinals would be a disappointment. 
Uh, yeah, they don't the have, quality that they have, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, not just that. They they don't have a, a, such a good group to begin with. Well, the seven the seven goals was a slap to my face to tell me to like sit down and be quiet because uh, maybe that wasn't a disappointment. I don't know. It was just a prediction. Let's see how how it goes yeah. more. They were yeah. two surprises. Speaking of a uh, Spain group. Oh my God. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Messi scored. Messi. <laughs> oh, my stream is back. <laughs> it was a great goal from very far out. It was it was low, hard. What I can see is Messi was attacking, so my stream is back. Okay, Messi the, the ball's out now. So could we oh, say see, that there we go. Game, They're going to win the whole thing. Can we say this? Uh, <laughs> this, is a, this game is Messi against Mexico? Yeah, pretty much, because the rest of his team are not uh, doing anything as usual. So, okay, uh, on the side, we mentioned Argentina's, uh, we can't, kind of touched upon Argentina's last to uh, Saudi Arabia. Surprise, wow, upset. Second upset, definitely Germany losing to Japan. Not that, okay, Japan, is bad. Not that Japan is bad. I really like the, the Samurais, the Blue Samurais. They've always been good, like, since uh, ever since I got memory. Uh, but come on, it's Germany. Uh, one 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 point to note on the, on Germany. Uh, they play Spain tomorrow uh, oh, Sunday yeah. if because this is going to come out after the game's already done. And if Spain defeat Germany, Germany will be knocked out. Well, <gasps> oh yeah. yeah. Now that would be at this point. <sighs> I mean, they got knocked out of group stage last time, so. Yeah. So what are you saying? We should have been there. <laughs> we no. had Germany in the qualifications. No, that no, no. Bro, bro, we didn't, we didn't deserve it. Yeah, we got slapped not, in the face after that. Not after halfway through, but for the entire first half of the qualifiers, we definitely deser- deserve that. Like things yeah. changed so yeah. much after one incident and one incident alone, which I'm not getting into again. Mm. If you, if you have the important to... thing is whoever is listening to just uh, keep an eye on Wales uh, and uh, Croatia, whatever you can, like whatever you guys know, uh, you can inform us. There are some match reports after the games which we can uh, check it out uh, on FIFA. Um, anything to add, guys? Um, I hopefully I think that's, that's the perfect way to wrap this up. I mean. Mm-hmm. Hopefully we'll, we'll be back with more episodes, maybe some new exciting things coming up before Christmas or after Christmas. We'll see. No, 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 no. Let's let's not say anything about what or when, but <laughs> good things are coming. This is for Pogentron. Always good things coming. Any last remarks, guys? Nope. All's Great. good. Very on we go to the next one. In detailed uh, comment, Adam. Uh, yeah, very something to think about. Okay, if Chatton says it, it's all good and everything is all right, then I take it as to face value. You've listened to the men. You've listened to Football Kentron. And so long. This has been Armin on behalf of Adam and Chatton. It was beautiful talking to you. Until next time, baby.